You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Find more great shows like this at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. It is great to have all of you here today. This is another episode of The Swamp Explained, and this is an, a series where Rob Cortell and I are joined uh, together to talk about the swamp and how Washington works. Rob's a 45-year fly on the wall in Washington, D.C., and Rob has worked for Republican presidential campaigns, government agencies like the EPA, and has been confirmed by the Senate to the U.S. Federal Maritime Commission. He's also been a candidate for Congress and Senate, and given his experience and iconoclastic viewpoints, Rob gives us a great insight into the swamp that makes up our nation's capital. Uh, joining me now is Rob Cortell from, uh, where are you at now? Uh, I'm on Gwen's Island in Matthews County today. Okay. And, uh, it, a gorgeous day down on the water, and uh, you're looking at me, you can see that I am about half blinded by the light off of the water here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been beautiful and sunny here, and so when it's 46 degrees in the Midwest in the springtime, everybody goes out. I was wearing shorts yesterday. I will not put on lake prisons today. It's, <laughs> when it's nice out, we, we're, we're all, nope, it's spring now. So that's right. Yeah. Uh, so lots to talk about. I yeah. think we should start with the presidential race. I can't think of now, obviously my memory of politics really only kind of goes back to 92. Um, you know, Joe Biden basically was dead and 96 hours later was the front runner. And I can't think of a time where anybody kind of had a Lazarus-like resurrection in modern politics. I mean, is there any parallel to Joe Biden's complete destruction turned front runner, I'm going to be the nominee status? Um, you know, I, th I think they're probably, the one that comes to my mind immediately, of course, is George H.W. Bush after he was running, when he was running for president, after he, he had, uh, when, he, when he was vice president. And I think, I can't remember, but there were a stack of candidates against him. And, uh, and we, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Pat, uh, uh, what's his name? From, yep. came, at him, yeah, from, came at him from the right. And, uh, and uh, South Carolina was our firewall then. And mm -hmm. South Carolina is, has been a firewall, I think both to Democrats and Republicans. I, it, it, frankly, it doesn't surprise me. Um, and it's much more traditional uh, it's a better representation, frankly, of the body politic than either New Hampshire or Iowa. So I think a lot of candidates kind of get that. But this is where this really is a media circus and a contest and everything else. You know, if there were no, if there were no ups and downs, Chris, we wouldn't have a thing to talk about. No, exactly right. So there's yeah. always something interesting happening. Uh, why? Well, if there's not anything interesting happening, we're going to make something up. That's exactly right. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> Um, no, we talk about my new haircut. <laughs> yeah, right. I like your haircut. <laughs> uh, so why is South Carolina, it's always termed the firewall for some candidate, Rudy Giuliani in 2008, George Bush in 88, Joe yeah. Biden in 2020. Is it because Iowa, New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire, t talking like I'm from New Hampshire and, uh, Nevada has snuck itself in there, but I mean, it's a caucus state. So is it because yeah. it's the first real contest? It's, it's the first real contest where people actually go out and have to pull a lever or some equivalent. You know, um, Iowa is lily white. Um, Vermont is lily white. Um, Nevada, I noticed uh, Harry Reid was claiming was the first real show of, of uh, a broad demographic, which I suppose is technically true, but you know, Nevada is not a real state. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like eighty-five percent federal land. Yeah, right. And and you know, you know what they say: what happens in uh, in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Yeah. And I, I'd say that's about as much influence as Nevada has on it too. But so South Carolina is the biggest of the of the fir first round of actual um, state voting. And you know. Biden actually did really well across the board. Uh, we're still waiting to hear from California, um, which could maybe change the outlook, but I, I suspect it's not gonna change it that much. You know, the, um, uh, remember, I think last time we were talking, uh, the, the percentage of people who vote early is massive. And I suspect in California, it's 
probably between 30 and 40%. And if they're doing it, if you could reel yourself back a couple of weeks before Vermont, I'm, I'm sorry, before New Hampshire and Iowa, <clears throat> um, the reality is the guy who had momentum at that point was Biden. Mm -hmm. So, so um, among the early voters. So I would not be surprised if a lot of the, if a substantial portion of the early voters in California were Biden or one of the more centrist candidates at the time. Um, so the, the problem with elections now is that you really can't put them in a, a, a straight time frame. You sort of have to figure out at what point, um, at what point the voter, what, what does the voter know at the point at which he or she is making the decision? And uh, er, early voters make it over the course of sometimes as much as, if I recall, 30 days in some cases. So it's very hard to tell. So if somebody voted just two weeks before um, uh, Super Tuesday in any of those states, uh, they would not have known that uh, who won Iowa or who won um, New Hampshire. Right. And so, at that point, Joe Biden had the momentum. Y yeah, because he seemed like the he's the one name ID matters a lot in politics and people don't yes, totally, does. totally get that. And so it's the, the single most important factor in what, how someone votes. I totally agree. They, they have a familiarity with that person. Joe Biden was the vice president. He's been in politics forever. He's not an unlikable person. I mean, I think Joe Biden's likable. Uh, and it's, and then you have Bernie Sanders who had the organization advantage because he still had all that organization from 2016 and nobody else did. Obviously, Bloomberg built up, and we'll talk about uh, Mini Mike here in a moment. Yeah, right. Um, but uh, well, but also, I think Biden represents uh, a return to normalcy. Now, who right who campaigned on that? Do you recall? Uh, it was was it Coolidge? Nope. No, it was it was after uh, Warren Hart G. Harding. Right, Harding was he was the return to normalcy. Yes, and he okay. followed whom? Uh, so was Woodrow Wilson. Yes, that's correct. Right. Yeah. So, and then Harding uh, turned out to be super corrupt. <laughs> well, and he died anyway. So it didn't yeah. much matter. And Coolidge, of course, was uh, silent Cal, cool Cal. And, so uh, here's, my, here's my question. Is, is it that everybody started paying attention around Iowa and got a look at all the other candidates and went, we're just going to go with the guy that seems the most safe? I think in South Carolina, it was simple demographics. And I think, and if you look across at most of the states voting that he won, again, um, it is largely um, an alignment with Democrat, Democrat demographics, which are uh, largely um, African-American. Uh, is, is this one of the highest percentages? And so um, I, I think that's a group that's been very loyal. And he, he got uh, a tremendous percentage of that group everywhere in each of those primaries. Um, Bernie also did not apparently, you know, he, he was appealing to the, the youth vote. Um, a lot of the youth he appealed to eight years ago are not so youthful um, <laughs> anymore. They don't they're fit in that vote. They're paying taxes now, Rob. That's right. And they're probably, that's right. And they're probably voting, but he was, he's trying to appeal to the younger voters. And once again, the young voters did not turn out in the primaries. And I think there's a lesson there for the general too. You know, no matter what we do, young voters um, have lots of other reasons and impediments to voting. They may live at school and not want to vote there or not be registered there. They maybe just don't think it's worth their time. They, they're too busy. You know, um, they don't feel motivated. They have no um, self-interest. Uh, so I think that's the big disappointment for Sanders. Yeah, it seems like Biden won so big in South Carolina that everybody was kind of waiting to see, can this guy actually pull it out? And then they went with the winner. All of a sudden, all the endorsements started coming out of the woodwork. Well, that was a good week for him. Yes, there's yeah. no question. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think, I do think a lot of Democrats are genuinely scared to death of Bernie. Um, although I, I did see an interesting article. Um, I think it was the, either the Post or the Times today or yesterday uh, that compared uh, Bernie to Reagan. And I thought yeah. that was a very interesting one in which he, he essentially, you know, Reagan ran in 64, uh, I'm sorry, in 60, he really kind of semi-challenged um, um, Nixon, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was 64. It was six, it was 68, 64. 68. 
Yeah, because 64 is when he gave the was go, Well, 64 yeah. was Goldwater. Right. And then he semi-challenged uh, Nixon in 68 and didn't do very well. And then, and then um, in uh, 72, the campaign I was in, of course, he, he ran a serious challenge against Ford, as we discussed in the last one, and really lost the nomination by basically one vote. And, um, and then he went on after Ford lost to become the nominee and president four years later. And so uh, he, at the time, was viewed as uh, an intellectual lightweight, um, kind of shrill, uh, demagogic, you know, off to the far right, a cowboy. You know, I, I remember my own reactions at the time, and I certainly would have been considered more of a, uh, an establishment centrist, center-right Republican. Um, he, was, he scared all of us to death. And yet he went on to become the, the face of the party. He remade the party. Um, and I, I think Trump is doing the same thing to the Republican Party, although much more destructively. Uh, Reagan had a better sense of, of how to govern. He had already governed the third largest country on the planet, that being California, and, and the third or fourth largest budget on the planet, and so on and so forth. So he, he had real governing experience and a sense of what you could do and not do and the power of the word. Uh, but Bernie is not dissimilar in terms of his potential, according, you know, thinking about this article, to, to remake the Democratic Party. He may well lose again, or he may, if he wins, um, he, he could be Reagan from the left, um, remake the, the politics of the party, the ideology of the party. Um, and I'm not, I, I would not count him out in terms of his ability to debate, out debate, uh, Donald Trump, because he has a lot more conviction, um, and he, he maybe he could rouse enough people uh, against Trump. So I, I'm not someone who automatically says he can't win, but I do think the Democrats are scared to death of him, and that's really what happened. And I, I think they're also nervous about Biden. You know, Biden has taken some time to warm up on the stump, and that's kind of problematic. He's he, He's got to figure out a way to both out, out, um, uh, out nice, out, and, and at the same time kind of out shout Trump, but not in the same nasty way Trump does it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, he, so here's my, Biden gave a great speech on Super Tuesday night. He did. It's clear that his speech writers, he hired Pete's speech writers to yeah, rewrite right. his speech. Um, right. And he hit a lot of notes that I think will speak to a lot of independents in that we were going to return to normalcy. We're going to return to a time. And this is his best pitch. Remember yeah. how good you had it under Obama? Like everybody was miserable under Obama and hated Obama. But now under Trump, we're also miserable because A, the media makes us feel that way. And then B, so some of us are genuinely miserable. Uh, and, <laughs> um, and so he, he had a very good appeal. He had a very good speech. And here's my only concern with Biden beating Trump. It's that the this is not who we are line has never worked against Donald Trump. It didn't work no. for the 16 Republicans. It didn't work for Hillary Clinton. It hasn't worked for the media. It hasn't worked for Nancy Pelosi and the impeachment. Like the people genuinely go, yeah, no, this is who we are. <laughs> We're all. So well, so and, and, I, and I think if you think about the, the, the context of the environment into which he's running. So um, <clears throat> there's no question that the Democrats did Donald Trump a favor with impeachment because they basically allowed um, his people to beat the crap out of Biden's son. And that Joe Biden's son is going to be the, the, the email uh, issue of the 2020 election campaign. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the Republicans are trying to raise it in hearings in the Senate, which they can, although it was interesting, Romney sort of flirted with opposing that. And then he was assured by the chairman that, uh, that, it would not be partisan. Well, I'm sure we all believe that. <laughs> uh, right. And, um, and, and, you know, as, as unseemly as that deal was with Biden's son and all that, and it's very hard to believe he didn't know it since he had to file ethics forms like the rest of us. Um, uh, nevertheless, that's going to be the issue. And that, that is, that is going to be the main impact of the impeachment hearings is to have given Donald Trump another big issue against the likely candidate, Joe Biden. I also feel that, it, yeah, I also feel that it gives him a, a, an appearance of Teflon, an appearance of they came at me, I won. Completely. 
yeah, you can't, if he screws up again, what are you going to do? Try impeachment again? Which they, the, which they flirted at with, when he, with the, the uh, Roger Stone stuff. They were like, should we try it again? It's like, well, but Nancy Pelosi, I think we all know that Nancy Pelosi put the kibosh on all of that. Yeah. Understanding exactly what it's, you know, what it would be doing. But um, kind of trying to remember where I was going on that whole line about that. Um, but I, I but think Hunter uh, Biden, so, well, the biggest vulnerability is Hunter. Yeah, the biggest vulnerability is Hunter. And uh, Trump, uh, I think Trump's big vulnerability may well be uh, the coronavirus and uh, hmm. uh, or COVID-19 as it's properly called. Um, and this, in some ways, this is, this could be the revenge of the deep state, you know, um, it, it kind of, if we walk over th there for a minute, um, you know, early January, I think it was around the third, um, they first got word at CDC that something was going on in China. And then it took a week or two weeks before they knew enough about it to be able to have any point of view. And then, um, and China, of course, is totally opaque. They, I don't know, I think they didn't let any other countries in to look at it for almost a month and a half. And they, you know, they basically silenced everyone who made it public aware of it. And the one young doctor died who kind of broke out of that. And then, um, and you realize January 3rd is only about nine weeks ago. Yeah. That's when we learned about this new coronavirus. And I, I think objectively, the, the deep state did their job. Um, although, uh, you know, there's another article in the Post today about how all that went and who told whom what. But um, one of the, un, I, the, the big kind of um, holdback in all of that is that you know, the test itself has to be made essentially by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Whereas in Europe and everywhere else, the test is made commercially, and I suspect they'll go to that. And I, I have no doubt the reasons are uh, for, for reasons of certification and so on and so forth. But yeah, um, so I read, I saw a Twitter thread where basically this woman thought she, she had respiratory issues, she thought she had it, so she called like five or 10 agencies and doctors and hospitals and the CDC and or the State Board of Health, and nobody had any access to it. And couldn't find it, and when and nobody knew where to get it, and everybody was ill informed, and it was just it was sort of like it, it's your nat natural bureaucracy at work, right? If if a bureaucratic institution's in charge of something, it's not going to function correctly. And since then, my uh, I have a friend who works at a school. Their school uh, this week was contacted by six different agencies, preparing them to close them down for a week. And I I suspect that. You know, by first, by what you mean by deep state, it's that we're just now getting to a place where tests are available and they're not $10,000 right, and right. it wasn't mobilized early on. And secondly, it took the, the specter of getting a chunk of that $6 billion for local agencies to actually start working on this. Well, yes, but I, again, I, I'm sort of, there, there's a balance here because I actually think the the, the so-called deep state actually kind of did its job in a responsible way. Oh, okay, uh, gotcha. Is my point, but but not that, that they actually, were thwarting Trump, but that they were actually moving as they're supposed to. They're, they were moving as they were supposed to, which is to figure out what the, what was going on. It took um, some time for them to clone the the gene and to determine what the characteristics of it were. Um, you have to do that before you can figure out and. Uh, you know, an anti, um, sure. you know, vaccine. Of course, a vaccine can't do anything about the fact that it's, um, uh, once you have it, you know, once you have it, you can't do anything about it. So the vaccine is to prevent it. Um, the Chinese in the last uh, couple of days have released a very detailed um, um, uh, a set of uh, procedures and practices and things that they tried in the early part of the period of all of this. Um, but again, this, this is where, this, so I sort of think this is one where, again, the media is helping to, is helping Trump because every commentator, I cannot go on the TV and, you know, I watch a wide range of TV down here since we don't get newspapers on an island. <coughs> Uh-oh. But, uh, but uh -oh. uh, yeah, that's, that's not, no, 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 I'm safe. You're away, you're a long ways away from me. Uh, I don't know. Um, 
Right. Uh, internet, the internet these days. <laughs> yeah, I know. Touch, touch. Um, so, help, but so, help Trump is what you're saying. But but there's nothing you you can't. You know, the day he stood up there with all of the of the uh, doctors and and uh, experts and everything else, and they had a clear story, and you know he mumbled around his thing. There were people. All of the commentators were saying, "Well, who's? What's the story? Um, why is it so confusing?" When are they going to get their act together? Um, why can't they deliver a million and a half doses today? And the consequence is you see this woman, a Trump supporter, 10 days, you know, a week later saying, well, I don't think it's real. <laughs> right. and, and, and that's because the media drumbeat is just like every other issue. They cannot give him credit for doing anything. There's no, you know, there's no question that he is an idiot. There is no question that he, um, that he uh, is not an expert. Um, but there, by the same token, there is no question that the thing he should be doing is reassuring people that it's not, that you can walk outside of your house in most places and not have to worry about it. And there are some common, simple common sense things you can do. So, you know, it's a, it's a real balance. I, I sort of, I feel sorry for any leader, whether it's uh, you know Governor of New York or or the Mayor of you know, Washington or wherever, trying to balance um, this whole issue of calm down, you know, calm down, have a drink. Kind of and, thing. and that that and I actually think that he had a fairly good week as he was discussing it because if you go back and watch his press conference or the Fox News town hall or you see Mike Pence last week on the Sunday shows, like they. They were very calm. They were like, listen, we don't know. There's, they were telling the truth. And the reality is the media for clicks wants to hype this up to a point that it's yeah. that this Costco shelves are being overrun. People are in full body plastic suits on airplanes. Like they have, they have scared yeah. people half to death. And because Donald Trump isn't freaking out in the way that they want him to freak out over this nonsense – like, wash your hands, you're going to be fine. Like, it's like the West Nile virus, but they're pretending it's the bubonic plague. Well, it's and not nearly so bad as the West Nile virus in terms of transmission because exactly. we, can't, we couldn't control the little mosquitoes running around. Yeah, uh, the, but, the reality is the Wuhan, in the Wuhan province, they had a potluck dinner with 40,000 families, and that lit the thing on fire. And then all yeah. of a sudden, two weeks later, everybody, they had the crisis. It's like we're, Donald Trump was very presidential in the way that he handled a lot of this. But the headlines out of it were Donald Trump disagrees with experts and scientists. Right. Isn't he a buffoon? And it just yeah. makes people. Of course, of course, one of his problems is he has no credibility with anyone beyond his, uh, right. his base. So, but remember that, that he had a 50%, 49 to 50% favorability immediately after impeachment. So yeah. um, people should be careful about what they think is going on there. But to your point about the, uh, shelves. My son is, I think I've mentioned, is a chef in Sydney, Australia. Hmm. And uh, he, he sent us pictures last week of everything stripped from the shelves, particularly toilet paper. And, um, and of course, I said to him, I hope he had gone down and taken some himself. But uh, anyway, so it's not here, just there. But here. you know what? What's interesting in this little tiny county of Matthews, where we have 8,000 people living on the shore, of the lower shore of the Chesapeake Bay, um, everything's fine in the grocery stores. There's plenty of cold meds, you know, everything you need, toilet paper, whatever. So, yeah, of course, that's a group our, of people that may not believe it's a real issue. Right. We So here in Indiana, in Indianapolis, we got our first case, a Marion County resident, which is Indianapolis. And a friend posted a picture of a local Target where it was the entire aisle where they had Lysol wipes and hand sanitizer and toilet right. paper. The entire thing was emptied. And, and what I always try to say to people is like, listen, it's not that you are going to get quarantined for two weeks. It's that every other boob out there in the world thinks that they're going to be quarantined for two weeks. And so you always need to make yeah. sure that you stockpile some basics because you may not, you may not be able to get access because at, the, at our core, we're still like the same animal we were 10,000 years ago where we hear of a plague, like the smartest people I know are freaking out you the smartest people in our society and the media are freaking out about this thing and you're like how bad could this get and they're like oh well if you're elderly and you have respiratory issues you you probably are going to die yeah well but okay. it, well, then again, why am I this, freaking out <laughs> well it, there is this you know this question of belief i i have a very good friend in the tech community who i've known for years uh he's somewhat older than i am very well educated 
And um, we had an email exchange yesterday about um, a company that had shut down and, and he had observed, well, I don't know why everybody's so freaked out about it. It's just a cold, right? Like the flu. And, and I sent back a note saying, you know, it's 20 to 30 times more deadly than the flu. Uh, than uh, the flu, no, number one. And number two, if you're over 65, it's five to 10 times more than that. And if you're under 65, it's one fifth to one tenth as much as that. So very concentrated. So yeah, it's real. And, and you know, he, he didn't believe it, still doesn't believe it, I suspect. So, um, but, uh, but I do think, but Trump, of course, does stuff all the time. It reminds us of who he really is. So, <laughs> you know, at that CDC meeting the other day, he was quoted, he, he said, uh, uh, he was asked about whether or not to let the cruise ship on shore. And he, he said, um, uh, it will, I don't, you know, I don't want to do it. Others do. We'll let him make the decision, but, you know, it'll double my numbers. <laughs> you know, it's literally double my numbers. <laughs> and by that, he means the numbers of people that are sick on his watch and, and, he thinks of it purely in personal terms, and I suspect he does. And wasn't that what the New York Times was basically saying this weekend, that uh, he, he didn't want to put out certain information because he didn't, want, he didn't want to get blamed for the coronavirus, which the New York Times, Michelle Goldberg, writes this article, if you're feeling sick, it's because of Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the, well, the, now, the other side of that, so, so you know, the – the, uh, the, the big question is, does he believe it? So is he going to get himself tested this week um, from having gone to the, um, the uh, conservative? Oh, yeah, CPAC. Uh, CPAC. So that was uh, just last week in Maryland. And thousands and thousands of people, one of the people uh, with whom he came into indirect contact by a one, only one person in separation um, had, uh, has been diagnosed. And uh, most of his cabinet came into direct contact with that individual and have now come in contact with Trump at some level or another. So uh, the question is, are they going to take the test? And mm. by the way, this is one, I want to cycle back just one more second before we get off of this about the, the bureaucracy and the disinformation coming out of the news. I mean, the reality is, um, first of all, you really do have to concentrate your tests on people who you think are likely to have been exposed. And, and that is clearly what CDC did. Um, they got test kits to everybody in the early stages who could conceivably have been dis, um, exposed. And you realize that was no more than about four and a half weeks ago, uh, only three and a half, you know, three and a half weeks after it had been seeping out of China. Um, and, and so they're increasing that. And so, you know, this morning, uh, last night or the day before, Pence said, we'll have, we've gotten, what, however many hundred thousand out 300,000 out and we'll have another million by the end of the weekend. And, and all they're doing is showing pictures of the target was one and a half million. Well, I'm sorry. Um, they, they had a bad batch, by the way. So they had to dispose of that. They may well have made one and a half million, but maybe some people think throwing out a bad batch is a good idea. Um, and then, uh, so there's that. And frankly, there are not enough people who have the, the fear of it, the concern about it right now to use up 1.3 million kits, uh, maybe by the end of this week or next, there will be that many people, but by then they'll have produced another million or two million or whatever. So I personally, you know, and I, I have, it doesn't make me an expert, but I have a degree in biology and environmental science. I follow science. I'm reasonably well read on this stuff. I don't have any concern about our having enough kits to test the people who need to be tested. Where you're going to see the, the discombobulation is people on the margins you know, people who just want to be tested uh, out of fear and really have no, there's no obvious exposure pathway to them. Uh, and then you have, of course, this massive ship with several thousand people on board, and they really need to test every single one of those, and they need to do it yesterday. And that, to me, is kind of a big screw-up. That's, But those are massive, massive logistics nightmares. You know, in this, yeah. in this, uh, in, uh, think about the crew, um, of the, of the 42 or so people that were tested, 20 some had the, the virus and 19 were crew members. Now that sounds massive, but remember that ship probably had a thousand crew for a couple thousand passengers. So uh, we have to be careful about the numbers too. Yes. Yeah, By so the way, I have an issue for you. Okay. Daylight saving time. Yes. So let is me, that, let me so do this. It, 
I, I want to transition, and I have a great transition into Bloomberg. Okay. Because I think I want to talk oh, Bloomberg. Bloomberg, and then we'll talk Daylight Savings Time after that. Yeah, good. So I'm watching 60 Minutes, and Scott Pelley, I believe it was, was interviewing Mike Bloomberg uh, last Sunday before Super Tuesday. And Mike Bloomberg pushed some stupid notion about coronavirus and calling it a hoax. And Scott Pelley fact-checked him and said the president didn't say it that. In fact, what he meant is that X, Y, and Z was a hoax, but he didn't believe it. And it was such a news story that Scott Pelley of CBS News fact-checked the president on the positive side against a Democrat Hmm. that it made the news. That's how in the bag these people are invested in. (laughs) When somebody actually stands up for the president and gives facts, it's news. But I was impressed with Michael Bloomberg's operation because – what he had done in his $500 billion was build a, an organization in the way that Trump has built an organization, and now he's handing that over to Biden, and he had built the organization that Biden never had. It's and right. now, uh, But at the end of the day, Michael Bloomberg spent half a billion dollars to be told by millions of people, mm, no, we don't like you. Well, I mean, and, and, Bloomberg, you and Bloomberg was trolling for the same people – that Biden was trolling for right. and Klobuchar and, and, and uh, Pete and all the rest. So, um, and it's a very heavily, highly financed. It was, it, that was actually intended to be um, semi-commercial, not for profit when it was the, the um, targeting piece of that operation. Um, and it was intended the uh, targeting piece as uh, how you get a movement going to be successful. So I think it's gonna be enormously uh, helpful to uh, Biden, and it'll be interesting to see if Trump can counter it. Andrew Yang said on Saturday (laughs) night during the coverage that one of his former employees had gone to work for the Bloomberg operation, and they had in district, they could target almost every voter in the United States within every precinct that they could mobilize. And he really built on the back of, you know, Bloomberg folks, uh, the operation that Obama had. And, you know, when you have an operation like that, it's very hard to say, oh, Trump has this in the bag because Biden's an old fool. Like, no, when you've got that kind of data operation behind you and Bloomberg, if he does continue to spend money and deploy that, it it can make Biden really much more competitive in places that you didn't think he could be competitive than, uh, I mean, data is really key along with name ID. And so that could be huge. Uh, Well, but the issue still, the issue still in politics is, can you get people to the polls? Right. And so, so where a targeting operation like Bloomberg's or Obama's or frankly, the last time Republicans and so on and so forth shows its value is with the early voter. So <clears throat> if you can target the early voter, uh, get a ballot in their hands, see that they actually file it, um, you will have, um, you'll have 90 plus percent probability, I would expect, of getting their vote in the right place. And yeah. so, so that's, that is the, the benefit. Then you have the separate issue of the, the field operation. And I think the Bloomberg, um, the Bloomberg um, intent was to create an organization that not only could tell you who was the right person to deal with and, and who you'd like to get on board and what issues they cared about and how to move them intellectually, but um, also, uh, intended to be a way to motivate people to go out and get them to the polls. I mean, I, I certainly knew uh, my my daughter's mother-in-law uh, down in Texas was knocking on doors for Bloomberg. I was like, oh, who knew? <laughs> and But I assure you that every door she knocked on would have been the right door to knock on. Mm, right. And that's, and that's key. Yeah. yeah. Mo- drive out. Because that was Hillary's problem is she didn't motivate yeah. or mobilize the people she needed to mobilize. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I, I do think that it's, it's potentially true that this could overcome some of the Biden bland. But, you know, you and I have been talking about this for several weeks that I actually if not six or eight weeks. But, uh, you know, I continue to believe that I think Biden is still likely to get the nomination. And I think he's likely to pick Amy Klobuchar. Um, I think she would be a great um, kind of, st- again, stabilizing, nice personality. Uh, if I and I would absolutely not be surprised if, if uh Nikki Haley uh, takes Pence's place, and he's sent off to, I don't know, not what's the equivalent of Ireland for Mick Mulvaney, for <laughs> Michael Pence, you know, for, for, for Pence. Special and, uh, envoy to Slovakia or something. Yeah. 
But, Lesbos. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe Ukraine. Yeah. And, um, and uh, but I think it's a good chance. And I, if I had to lay money on the day many years out, you know, with very high odds against it, you know, I think either Amy Klobuchar or, or, uh, or uh, Nikki Haley is likely to be the next president in uh, 2024. I could see him picking Elizabeth Warren, uh, Biden picking Elizabeth Warren as a way to try and shore up the progressive wing. I could see that too. Yeah. I think that that would be a little bit of a mistake because I, when I, I think, um, uh, I, I don't think the progressive wing turned out for him um, the way the media has described it, partly because um, you remember the numbers are so small to move in the, in Iowa and New Hampshire, uh, you're talking about hundreds of people one way or the other, not hundreds of thousands. Uh, it's much easier. And number two, um, uh, he, he really did not move them that much in, uh, nor did, you know, between the two of them, they had 50%, I, I guess, close to it, but uh, no, they didn't. That's right, because uh, Biden was 49.8% in, in South Carolina, if I recall. Um, so I don't, I think the progressive movement is partly an anti everybody else movement. So, yeah. Uh, one final note about the election, then we'll go into daylight savings time. I cannot believe the, I mean, the press about Elizabeth Warren's exit has just been, they're beside themselves. And yeah. it's all, it's because she's a woman. Hillary Clinton came out and said, there's no doubt that it's because she's a woman that people didn't vote yeah. for her. And it's like, and I saw some, um, I follow, I'm friends with the editor of Bolerico. Oh, people didn't vote for Pete because he was gay. I believe that people didn't vote for Elizabeth Warren because they don't like an unlikable scold. I, you know that, but you know, people would argue that the language of calling her a scold is itself sexist. How many men do you know who've been called the scolds? I call Bernie Sanders a scold all the time. Uh, I, I <laughs> because he's a scold. A, yeah. <laughs> he's a scold. He is, he is an angry old white man, and she yeah. she just came across as an angry old white woman. I guess maybe that's a better way to say it. Yeah, yeah. Um, although she she kind of calmed down. No, but I do think there is an inherent inherently some amount of sexism. I think um, there's another article I read a, a couple of days ago about an interview in which a major a major magazine and maybe it was a women's magazine or something asked her um, how did she get such a lovely complexion and you know, geez, uh, when I ran, nobody asked me about mine. Although once right. I was described as having a swarthy complexion because I'd been in the sun and down running in Florida, and, you know, and a much darker wild hair and all that kind of stuff. And I enjoyed being called swarthy, but, and she, she replied ponds, you know, night cream or something, but, <laughs> but that is, that is only a question a woman again. I, I think there continues to be that. I don't think that's why she lost though. And I think there was an amazing lack of anti-gay in the vote against uh, Buttigieg. I just think he's he's pretty young. But uh, anyway, so by the way, you just made a mistake about mm. about time. What did you call it? Daylight savings time. It's singular. I know, but I don't. I, I'm a Hoosier. That's what we say here. But listen, you have to understand. <laughs> in Indiana, we're all Is that a Hoosier with an S. We're all brand new to this because we didn't start doing this until we elected Mitch. And then Mitch said, all right, this is enough. And then forced it through. It was a 30 year argument here. And in 2008, 2000, I think eight or nine, we started doing like daylight saving time. And uh, you have no, I'm convinced. You have no idea what a nightmare it was here when we didn't do it, especially in the radio industry. Every, twice a year, all of our automation would get screwed up. It, nobody ever knew where we were. And Daniels was exactly right. He was like, if everybody else is doing it, we need to do it too. It's costing us business. And it was. I'm convinced. There are lots of good reasons for it. And, you know, it was to save energy. And, and you can go through all these lists of um, um, it, it's to uh, save energy and to make it safer for kids coming home and blah, blah, blah. But I am convinced, and I was again reminded as I got up this morning in the pitch black, the sun had just, yesterday, the sun had been coming up as I get up at 5.45, you know. Right. And, uh, and today, it was pitch black for another hour. And I'm convinced that if Joe Biden came out and said, we're going to stop this silliness, we're going to do daylight savings time, saving time, or we're ah. going to do, 
yeah, right. Or we're going to do regular time, one or the other, but we're going to stop it or split the difference, even like the Russians. Um, he, that person would win because yeah. this is such a pain in the butt and everybody hates it. And, and, and you yeah. get so tired and that, you know, I work in morning radio. And so this week and show- then you get used to it. And by the time you get used to it, boom, yeah. it's, it's over. You know, I mean, I think it's actually more, I think we have more daylight saving time on the calendar than we do um, regular time. Right. So, yeah. might as, so you might as well stay at daylight saving time. So I'll give the listeners a little bit of history about it just because I, I've been interested in this. So the time zones and time standardization came about with the invention of the railroads because the railroads would go town to town. And before the railroads really came into, into play in the mid 1800s, you'd go from Plainfield to Avon to Danville to Amo. And there would be a different, they, they set their clock tower based on when the sun was right overhead at noon. And so you're, you're, you have a few minutes off everywhere you went. And so they needed a standardized time to make the tra trains run on time. And then in World War I, they, they started daylight saving time to, uh, to, standard, to give people an extra hour of prep and also for the agrarian society, more time to farm in the evening. And then now it's just basically like what you said, it's about saving energy. It supposedly gives us more, it gives us uh, some sort of savings on lights and air conditioning. And so that, that it would be billions of dollars in energy yeah. cost if we, if we changed it. And that's sort of why nobody touches it. But I agree. I think by and large, people think it's a real pain in the butt. It's stupid. You know, our next week at work, because everybody gets up at two or three, everybody's going to be super cranky for the next week or two. Uh, and it just, it's sort of annoying. And, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I think if somebody and, took a strong stand against it, it'd be popular. And what do you want to bet that sometime in the next 48 hour cycle, Donald Trump is going to say, I hate this switch. Oh, Let's just 100. leave it at daylight saving time. And he's yep. going to win another 5% of the vote. Yep. I, I, because that's the, that's the beauty of Donald Trump is he understands right. that it doesn't and matter if he can get it done or not. Bernie Sanders is the same way. It doesn't matter if you can do it or not. It's what people care about. Yeah. And I can imagine around, uh, around Biden, his issue team is saying, oh, we can't do this because there's the pros and there's the cons. Right. And what do you do when you don't switch back and blah, 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 blah. blah. I, so I can see that really easily. People love confidence. Yeah, I agree. Even if you're a confident idiot, like Donald yes, Trump. Yes, even if you're a confident idiot. Yes. <laughs> so, well, let's see. So we've done, uh, we've done disease. We've done, um, uh, we've done politics. We've done, uh, whoops. Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, Did no, I, I just lost you. Uh -oh. <laughs> I lo oh, well. Um, I lost your picture, <laughs> but that's just as well. Um, <laughs> no, you don't have to look at me. No, no, well, no. nor me. I, I guess you can see me. I just can't see you. So we've got 20 minutes left. Let's talk about yeah. the Jones Act because there's been some developments and we've been meaning to talk about the Jones Act a little bit. Yeah. And so why don't you catch us up on it and let us know where, where things are at. You've been speaking at the Cato Institute about it, I've, I've noticed. And so w first give like an elevator pitch of what the Jones Act is and then give us an update. Yeah, so... Um, so for those uninitiated, the Jones Act is a law that requires uh, you to use American built, bought, manned, owned, operated ships if you're going to sail a ship between two points in the United States and drop off cargo, pick up and drop off. And there's a sister law called the Passenger Vessel Act, um, which says you can only be one of these kinds of ships if you're going to pick up an American cruise passenger and cruise him from, let's say, New York to Miami. And um, it sort of sounds nice on the face of it. It's a 1920 law um, that was passed after World War I. Um, we did not have enough ships. The law, the bigger law, was intended to help um, increase shipbuilding in the U.S., which had gone stagnant, and to rebuild the fleet. And immediately after the war, they basically had, had rebuilt the commercial fleet during the war for carrying supplies. And they basically turned that over to commercial industry. And that might well have been the highest point it ever was until World War II when they had a similar problem. And then uh, after that, uh, the fleet has declined from uh, some 60,000 ships, meaning they have a deep draft, they, they can sail out in the ocean, they're self-propelled to something under uh, uh, 
79 or 80 today, something like that. Um, and the people who continue to support it uh, claim that it benefits um, the military by allowing us to have a busy commercial fleet that in time of war can be thrown right in to help resupply the troops overseas and, and which creates uh, lots of, of jobs on board these ships uh, for sailors you, who, you know, they have eight hour um, turns. And so they're like three for every job. Um, and the reality, unfortunately, is very different. The shipyards have no new orders today. The only orders they have are, are defense, uh, very large, very expensive, very complex, and very uh, largely uh, poorly delivered ships, frankly, in a lot of ways. Um, they, uh, the number of jobs is, you need about 1,800 or 2,000 sailors to run um, the, the uh, resupply during a major conflict. We don't even have 13 or 1,400 of them. Um, and and the average age of a guy in this in a labor guy in the March Marine now is in the 50s, late 50s. Um, some of them are as old as in their late 90s, and they're considered active. So um, it's it's a pretty disastrous outcome. And the 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 big economic thing it has done is it disadvantages Americans in in shipping. So. Um, the cost of the ships built in the U.S. is three to five to six times higher than it is anywhere else in the planet. And they are no better, um, but uh, they just cost more because we just don't build them and we don't build well and we don't build enough. And so you start with a, uh, an investment disadvantage. And then uh, beyond that, um, once a, uh, someone buys one of these ships to stay inside the Jones Act trade, meaning from the continental U.S. to Hawaii or Alaska or Puerto Rico um, or up and down the coast, um, once you buy it, you never get rid of it. So most yeah. ships are retired at 20 years old. Jones Act ships average close to 40 years old. Um, our tanker fleet is way past. All tankers are required by law to be Jones Act built in the U.S. Um, this is one reason people go for um, uh, go for uh, pipelines, you know, so it's pushed up into pipelines. Um, and uh, it's, it's a mess. We don't, we don't have a shipbuilding industry. We don't have enough sailors. We have industries that have literally been put out of business in the U.S. Um, um, the uh, timber industry used to ship everything, a lot of it to the U.S. And now there's no domestic timber industry except local because they cannot ship at long distances because they can't get the right kind of ships. Uh, they used to ship cattle. They can't. Um, you know, uh, feedstocks, grain used to all go. Those all require specialized ships. They don't have them. And so it, this, however, is the third rail of, of um, special interest politics. You know, they always <laughs> say, say uh, social security is the third rail of American politics. But, but the Jones Act is the unknown, maybe fourth rail of politics. And everybody supports it because what they're told is, Oh, it's critical to national defense. And why are they told that? Because the labor unions um, funnel them a lot of money and the labor unions believe against all facts, against all facts to the contrary, that it's, it keeps them in business and it does not. It actually has destroyed them by making shipping so expensive that everything that used to go by ship now goes by trains or trucks. Uh, and in some cases by airplane. And so it's just, uh, you know, I headed a group trying to get rid of this in the 90s um, and it, uh, it's still there, but there are a number of interesting things. Um, for the first time, a congressman from Hawaii actually opposes it and has come out with several pieces of legislation to modify it, uh, particularly in their own context of Hawaii. They like to make themselves a special case, thinking that's gonna help them. Um, but this is uh, Steve Case, who was the founder of, AOL, or not the founder, but the CEO, took him public and all that. Um, his brother, Ed Case, is a congressman and has enough money not to give a hoot what the unions want to do to him. Uh, and he is a Democrat, so that's very unusual. For years and years, the delegation in Hawaii was bought off by the unions. Um, you know, in a way, and all these folks were pillars of the both the socialist state of Hawaii and the labor state of Hawaii and the Jones Act, <laughs> notwithstanding that it added a couple thousand dollars to every one of their constituents' bills. But, you know, that's, it's a good example of what in management we call reframing, Chris. You know, you, you can take an issue, and, and, and we see it in politics all the time, which is, 
here's one set of this this is a view of a certain issue and then this is the other view and it you know for anyone who's objective uh it's destroyed the fleet it's destroyed the sailors it's just you know there's no there's no benefit whatsoever it's just a cost he reframed it and its supporters in hawaii reframed it to be this is what keeps us alive otherwise we wouldn't <laughs> have anything come from the mainland all of which is untrue so so there are some things happening and i you know, there actually is going to be a debate, uh, I think, next week, uh, which I'll let you uh, make sure you can see all your, have all your listeners see. It's on the Maritime TV, um, and that'll be interesting. There is, um, there, there's sort of cracks here and there. I think Ed Case may have the best um, uh, ability to do something about it. Cato, of course, is hammering away and hammering away, uh, but there are diehard supporters everywhere, so if I had to give all of this a chance, uh, what what uh, percentage do I think uh, we'll have it modified or gotten rid of in a few in uh, in five years? I'd give it five percent, but that's fifty times greater than I would have given it ten or twenty years ago. <laughs> so. so, what is it about human beings that even though they're presented with evidence to the contrary, that they don't believe it? Well, that's that's a good question. You know, there's a lot written on that. You know these days. And, uh, and it's particularly true. Uh, I forgot this, uh, there's a new book out on identity politics. And I, I think, uh, you and I, maybe in one of our shows ought to go through some of these books for our read our listeners, because they're, they're whole sets of books trying to analyze some better than others. Um, but, um, this particular author, um, um, makes the point that we used to gather more around, issues or things which we jointly supported um, and you can create movements that way but today it's more about um, who uh, you who you identify with and support so um, and regardless of what the issue is so that's why so many people can support a trump or a bernie sanders regardless of whether they uh, agree with them on one major issue or another. It's because in, in their circles, uh, they, they can't, they, they don't want to be the odd man out. And I don't, I don't yeah. know that people make that, but you know, people, people are herd animals, just like, uh, you know, we are all animals, right? So we, we, I, the older I get, the more it's clear to me, human beings, uh, Th this is just like the animals we are. <laughs> this is going to mean nothing to you, but to our listeners, it may mean something. There's uh, the, the head of the party currently who's not running for re-election. His name is Nick Sarwark, He's head of the Libertarian Party. And he got into a spat with a guy named Maj Touré, who was a former Libertarian candidate in Philly. Now he's a Republican MAGA guy. And he says, oh, I left because of Nick Sarwark and all these things. And basically these two people, and, and there's a group of podcasters, who all basically just try to ding Nick Sarwark or uh, people on Nick's team try to ding the other team. A and it's just basically they're trying to grow their audiences by picking on each other. Yeah. And you're either with me or you're against me. And, and it's very effective. And it's completely that Donald Trump style of politics has completely changed the libertarian movement in the last three to four years. And I've seen it go from when I, when I started in 2008, it was about ideas. It was not about personalities. People jokingly said the word celebritarian. And then all of a sudden now, all that matters is, are you supporting the right celebritarian or not? And, you know, yeah. people like me, you got to pick a side. Are you with Dave Smith? Or are you with Nick Sarwark? And it's, and it's just a complete shift in the last decade of how the movement operates to its detriment to the point that people like yourself are going, ah, I see all this on Twitter. I don't want to get involved with these nuts. Yeah, although I'm I'm in constant Twitter wars on the Jones Act of all things, <laughs> <Yeah>. and uh, <laughs> what a surprise, right? Yeah. I, I have a I have a a, a opponent uh, who likes to throw out. He, he's a history professor at some little school somewhere in South Carolina or North Carolina. I can't remember which one. And uh, he, um, he, you know, there are people who are are single mindedly. Um, they, they cannot process that there may be other information outside of, uh, you know, their fact range. And, and even if it is outside of the fact range that they're familiar with or care about, um, they have to figure out a way to fit it into their view of the universe, or in this case, in my view, the Bible, you know, I, I view the 
Jones Act as a religion, uh, which explains a lot about its supporters, frankly. Um, yeah. you know, religion is a belief system at its core. And, um, and, and, you know, you asked about facts. Facts, um, people, people will fit contrary facts into their, their view of the universe. Um, I, I sure see it in my Twitter wars. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. and, and for those of you who want to follow these Twitter wars, um, you know, it's, uh, it's Rob Cortell uh, at, you know, at, at Rob Cortell. So you can follow it. And we always put that into the, into the show notes. So you can grab it there. Adam on LinkedIn as well. Yeah. Um, so we've come to the end where uh, Rob is a, dare I say a bon vivant. And likes to go uh, out I, to. I think a gourmand is what you were trying for. <laughs> and my, like my wife, my wife would get upset if you said I was a bon vivant. <laughs> well, I'm. I barely know what that means, <laughs> so I probably used it wrong. Um, <laughs> but you love to go out to eat. You love to go out and drink. You love to to take tours of Washington D.C. with uh, yeah. with your friends and make merry. And you always yeah. give us at the end of every show a good spot for people to go when they visit the nation's capital as they should. It's a very fun place to visit. Everyone should go at least once in their life. Yeah. And uh, when they do, where should they eat or drink? Um, well, uh, you know, it's been about two weeks since we last got together and I only had, had a couple days in DC, but uh, I went to a new restaurant called Albi, A-L-B-I, uh, also on the waterfront in Southeast. And it, uh, it's uh, the chef, Michael Rafiti, uh, who has a terrific uh, bona fides uh, in the Washington food scene and around, uh, has opened his first uh, single person, first restaurant that he's ever opened. And it's a Middle Eastern restaurant uh, in a luxury building down there. Um, he, he, uh, his, his previous uh, take was uh, with uh, sort of a, uh, Spanish uh, paella restaurant, Arroz. Uh, 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 this guy has Palestinian and Jordanian roots. And, uh, but he basically, first of all, the restaurant's beautiful. Second of all, um, it, it's just terrific. It's, um, it's kebabs and, I mean, the pita comes out of the oven hot and it's in this beautiful, uh, you know, like a football, uh, bigger than most, um, Lots of different kinds of shareable plates, uh, gorgeous uh, wood fire grill, so on and so forth. But it's called Albi. I think it's uh, it's hard to get into. Frankly, you, it's hard to make a reservation. Um, I, when I talked to the um, to the uh, host there the other night, um, he said they always keep a fairly high percentage uh, for walk-in. So if you're down in the waterfront uh, of DC on the southwest waterfront, uh, southeast waterfront, you should consider heading over there. And next door to it is a lovely bar, Maxwell's. Uh, Maxwell was, um, they, they have one other bar up on uh, 10th Street, if I recall. <clears throat> and it's a wine wine bar that has, uh, they have great sets of, of uh, you know, tasting trios and things like that. And uh, the, the two owners uh, kind of own, apparently, uh, uh, Rafidi has a small stake in Maxwell's and maybe vice versa. And Maxwell's uh, did his wine and liquor list and all that. So it's a great combo. Uh, we, my wife and I had a, a, a terrific dinner down at Albi. Again, it's Mediterranean. It's, it's um, very different than you will have had um, and very, very creative. Uh, and uh, afterwards, we had a nice drink at, at Maxwell's, which, by the way, had four women bartenders and uh, none, uh, none of them, you know, there were no men bartenders. So that was in itself a revelation particularly as we were about to head into uh, International Women's Week. Excellent. And there you have it. All right. We'll make sure to check Albies. Albies. How do you spell it? A-L-B-I. And, uh, and then Maxwell's down on right next door to it on the southeast waterfront. All right. Excellent. Well, Rob, thank you so much for joining me. Mm-hmm. All right. Great, it's fun. Great, great to talk to you, and we'll talk to you soon. More fun coming up. That's <laughs> exactly right. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Swamp Explained on We Are Libertarians, and we will see you very soon. <coughs> I held my cough. Uh. <laughs>